Try to imagine a time when the news was full of good news about economics. Um, much of the 1990s was that time. There was this period of record-breaking growth. If we look at stock markets, for example, the uh, the Dow Jones Industrial Average, which is often taken as like an indication of uh, how the stock market overall is doing. Anyway, that number um, was at 4,000 in early 1995. By early 97, it was at 7,000, and then it was up to 11,000 by early 99. And kind of everybody who was watching this, uh, even those who love capitalism, anybody who pays attention knows there's ups and downs. This is why it's called the business cycle. Uh, but in the late 1990s, some in the media were going as far as to say that the cycle was over and this was all like one big exception or maybe, you know, a new normal in which constant growth would just go on forever. The things would never stop improving. That was the great, the, the dream of the 90s was alive in the 90s stock market, I guess. Now, amidst all this uh, revelry, the, there was books like this published. This is Dow 36,000, which came out in 1999. As the title suggests, its authors predicted the Dow would hit 36,000 sometime between 2002 and 2004. And again, this came out around the time the Dow was at roughly 11,000. Spoiler alert, this did not happen. What actually happened was there was a massive downturn that came not long after this book was published uh, with the so-called dot-com bubble when that burst in, in 2000. Um, that downturn continued into the aftermath of the September 11th attacks in 2001. Overall, markets pretty much rebounded from 02 to 08, but then dropped by about half during the crisis of 08 to 09, and then started to rebound again. Um, the Dow still has not hit 36,000, though. That was uh, supposed to happen between 02 and 04, according to a couple of authors anyway. Still hasn't got there. Um, as I record this in October 2020, the Dow's all-time high was reached earlier this year at just above 29,000. Um, then COVID happened, and it plummeted back below 19,000 by late March. And since then, it's rebounded to something close to its, its all-time high. Um, and I imagine that Dow 36,000 book, that's probably worth about... 25 to 50 cents at your average secondhand bookstore, but this isn't a slight against those authors or even that book uh, Business books in general have a, have a very short shelf life um, But it's just kind of a sign of the times of the the you know what where things were at in 1999 with this uh, irrational exuberance as uh, Alan Greenspan the chair of the US Federal Reserve once said How do we think about these numbers and years and facts if we were reporting on daily business news for example at any point along the way, um, we would focus on the details of what happened in any one year or any one day, uh, the specific number of the Dow Jones Industrial Average on a certain day, uh, what percentage it had changed from the day before or the, the week or the month before, um, the specific number of layoffs that were announced by which corporation on which day, or which corporation bought out which other corporation, and for how much money, and when exactly. Day by day, those details, of course, matter a lot to a lot of people, to people in the industry. They matter a lot to uh, worried people who think about their investments too much. What you're supposed to do, I'm told, is to just put your money into something safe and not think about it day by day and just kind of let it grow slowly but surely over the, the long run, despite all these crises. Um, the numbers, of course, also matter a lot to the workers getting laid off during this period, of course. So I'll say a bit more on this later. But for now, I'll just mention that uh, through those amazing boom years of the 1990s, there were also massive layoffs all along the way. In fact, there were an average of 3 million layoffs a year in the United States from 1995 to 1999, just to give one example from one especially economically powerful nation state during those times. But those are not the perspectives that I'll be taking on this. I'm not an investment banker. I'm not an economist. I'm not a politician or a business journalist. Um, I'm also not a worker who was left desperate by these downsizings in the 90s. Although, I mean, you could say that my path from being raised in a working class family to becoming an academic over those same decades in between, that was shaped by the changes that I'm talking about to at least some extent. Whatever, the point is this video is not my you know, autobiography. I'm just leading up to the fact that I'm an anthropologist, so I'm going to talk about the stock market from an anthropological point of view. But more so than that, I'm going to talk about how to study power structures from an anthropological view, or a couple of ways of doing it anyway. And for that, I want to go back to a classic, Laura Nader's Up the Anthropologist Perspectives Gained from Studying Up, first published in 1972. 
unlike a lot of what I talk about in this series, it uh, it also it actually is pretty well remembered when, and well known still. It uh, it's you know 48 years old now, had a major impact in its time. It still gets cited a lot. It still gets summarized in a lot of textbooks. But the kind of research that it calls for is still a fairly small portion of what anthropology does. So I still think it kind of uh, describes this area of research that is uh, that, that shows a lot of untapped potential, I would say, especially in the times that we're currently living in. So I'll say a bit more about Laura Nader's work and uh, a bit more about what, it's, what other anthropologists have done with this idea more recently. So what is studying up? Well, to put it in simple terms, it's a perspective on culture. So why don't I start this by reviewing very briefly what culture is. It's what cultural anthropologists like me study, obviously. By culture, we mean a system of meaning shared by a group, one that usually works like a kind of conscious, taken for granted reality. It's, you know, operating in the background of how people live their lives. It includes things like standards of action. It includes value judgments. It includes ways of making meaning. There's more to it than this, but I don't want to get too sidetracked and make this video, you know, all about the culture concepts. Again, the point for now is that anthropology began as the study of the culture of usually colonized peoples, people who tended to lack power, or at worst were almost completely powerless and treated as subhuman in the colonial systems that were imposed upon them. And a lot of this was because, as I said in the past, anthropology began as one of the European schools of thought that came into being at a time when European powers were still competing with each other to colonize as much of the planet as possible. And so anthropology emerged in this context as the study of the so-called simple societies that were being colonized. And you know, roughly around the same time, sociology emerged as the study of so-called complex societies, the, uh, the places that were doing the colonizing, I guess you could say, or, or uh, the current and former colonies that had been since industrialized and urbanized. Um, I've mentioned in previous episodes that the, the boundary between so-called simple societies and so-called complex societies, that boundary never made sense to begin with. It was always a Eurocentric construction. Uh, all societies are equally complex in their own ways, and anthropologists and sociologists alike each do research, you know, all over the world in societies of all sizes, I guess you could say. But those assumptions still live on, even though most of us, when asked, disagree with them. The pattern still is, though, that anthropologists are still more likely to do research in former colonies on the culture of, for example, a hunter-gatherer group, um, and sociologists are still more likely to do research on social problems in major cities. It doesn't have to be this way, though, and often it's not. As I said, anthropologists and sociologists each do research, you know, anywhere now. But there's still this old assumption that anthropology studies so-called other places or small-scale societies to the point that when anthropologists do research on their own societies, sometimes that's given the awkward kind of title of repatriated ethnographies. And uh, I dislike that concept quite a bit, in part because I don't really see ethnography as, you know, belonging to a particular country. And to me, the issue isn't what country it's done in, but how the research is done and, and, and for what purpose. But even when anthropologists do research in cities in Western societies, they're still most likely to study the cultures of relatively disempowered groups within those cities. This fact was just something that was taken for granted, or more likely just not noticed or thought about, I guess, by most anthropologists. Um, the reality is anthropologists tend, tended to study people who were less powerful than themselves, or those who were seen as exotic or you know, deviant or somehow outside the mainstream. So as Hugh Gusterson put it in 1997 in this kind of retrospective on, on this studying up concept, I'll just read you a quote from his article. He wrote, In many cases, anthropology's traditional taste for the marginal and exotic has not so much been transgressed as imported and transposed upon American society, leaving us with more studies of Scientologists and crack dealers than of federal bureaucrats and corporate executives. But back to the original point, Laura Nader did not say that it was a bad thing to study disempowered groups. She goes through a number of examples of important works that did just that. But she wanted the discipline to come to terms with its bias towards doing this kind of work, basically studying marginalized and powerless groups almost exclusively. She wanted the discipline as a whole to, you know, think of why that was the case and also to imagine what else was possible. 
And just as a sidebar, even though I'm a Canadian making this for a mostly Canadian audience, uh, most of the content today is, is US-based. That's where the sources are from, and it's also one of the uh, structural biases in anthropology. So I just wanted to mention that there'll be some Canadian content coming up in future episodes. Uh, anyway, Laura Nader's main reason for wanting to study something other than powerless groups I think basically is capitalism. Um, she didn't say that word in the article, but I think it was what she was referring to, especially in this quote. She wrote, The study of humanity is confronted with an unprecedented situation. Never before have so few, by their actions and inactions, had the power of life and death over so many members of the species. That's a very succinct way of summing up the global political economy as of 1972. And so given how powerful the powerful were, Maybe it was worth spending some time studying the culture of the powerful. Uh, or as Laura Nader put it very succinctly, again, instead of asking why some people are poor, we could ask why some people are so affluent. And in particular, she said there were three main reasons why anthropology should maybe do this. Uh, the first one is scientific adequacy. Anthropology was supposed to be a holistic discipline, one that studied every aspect of you know being human. But to that point, it had mostly you know, sort of taken political power and inequality for granted, you know, by omission, I guess, as some kind of invisible force, and uh, just studied how people on the receiving end of that power and domination were, were coping with it. Um, the, the, the next uh, point was democratic relevance, as the Marxists love to say that, that the point is to change it, right? So maybe if we understand the cultural factors behind all this inequity and domination, maybe we'll be more useful at, at challenging it. And uh, the third was, in, in Laura Nader's words, quote, energizing and, and integrating effect that doing this kind of research has for many students. So uh, that was 1972. Let's see if it happens in 2020. See if you feel energized and uh, integrated by, by the end of the summary of Laura Nader's work. It seems that Nader was right about this energizing effect in, in her day. I'm not going to say too much about this to avoid kind of slipping into cliches. But the context of these thoughts was all the social upheaval of the late 60s and early 70s. Um, youth countercultures, the, the horrors of the Vietnam War, the anti-war movement, feminism, the gay liberation movement as it was called at the time. The civil rights movement was still recent and it inspired some, some newer and, and in many cases more militant movements for racial justice. Um, power was being questioned and challenged a lot all across society. And uh, there was an important role in this for anthropology, Laura Nader was trying to say. And uh, that continued, of course, through the years after this era. For example, there was a collection of papers that I've mentioned, uh, I think, already in this video, published in 1997 on the 25th anniversary of the Studying Up article. And uh, the intro summed up some of the developments to that point and made a case for the continued relevance of, of that approach of Studying Up as of the late 90s. There had been the crisis of representation, as it was called, of the 80s and into the 90s, which uh, there's, it's really hard to summarize this quickly, but I'll try. Um, I think it amounted to the questioning of what anthropology was for in a globalized world, where every message and text is biased to at least some extent, and where the people anthropology usually studied were perfectly capable of representing themselves and their own cultures. So what use is anthropology in that world? Um, there was also the influence of Michel Foucault and his analysis of power um, all across academia. It became especially popular in anthropology, I think. Um, looking at power basically as something that isn't just exercised upon ordinary people, but something that also becomes a part of ordinary people's everyday lives a part of people's identities and relationships to everyone and everything around them. Just to try to summarize, you know, thousands of pages of compl complex theory into uh, a couple of sentences. I don't know, I try. Now to tie all of that together, this is how Gusterson summarized the situation by the mid-90s. He wrote, In a world marked by a wrenching intensification of capitalist accumulation and inequality, by the globalization of industrial and bureaucratic elites, by the enduring strength of the national security state, and by the growing power of new techno-scientific elites in the electronics and biotechnology industries. In that context, there was as much a need for studying the powerful as ever. So 
there you go. Even though I often feel kind of nostalgic for the 90s, as you can tell by this quote, they also weren't really the best of times. Um, that was written 25 years after Studying Up was published. Um, think about the state of the world now, another 23 years later, and I think that we can still use more critical studies of power. So let's look a bit closer at how some anthropologists have, have done that. But back to the original Nader piece from 1972, she wrote that a lot of the excitement around studying up came from studying bureaucracy, studying institutions and organizations that affect people's everyday lives. Things like, for example, the California Insurance Commission, the Better Business Bureau, and uh, air pollution agencies, which uh, when you read them out like a list like I just did, sounds probably very boring. Those don't sound like especially fun field sites, I guess. Uh, especially not for a discipline that normally specialized in studying, you know, tropical islands. Um, but, you know, notwithstanding all of that, Laura Nader kind of speculated that a lot of the appeal in doing this kind of studying of research in offices in North America was in demystifying these systems of power, powerful organizations that govern large parts of our lives, often without being questioned or thought critically about. Or, as Laura Nader put it, maybe studying up was an attempt to, quote, get behind the facelessness of a bureaucratic society, to get at the mechanisms whereby faraway corporations and large-scale industries are directing the everyday aspects of our lives. I think that all sounds great, um, but despite, you know, my excitement and Laura Nader's excitement 48 years later, studying up was still rare at that time, and it's still rare today. Um, I've already mentioned some of the historic bias where, you know, anthropology used to study small-scale, faraway societies and groups, um, you know, far away from the anthropologist, I should say. Uh, Nader also speculated that that fact also had a significant influence on the methods of anthropology wherever anthropologists do research. So to quote that 1972 article again, she wrote, Anthropologists might indeed ask themselves whether the entirety of fieldwork does not depend upon a certain power relationship in favor of the anthropologist, and whether indeed such dominant slash subordinate relationships may not be affecting the kinds of theories that we are weaving. What she's getting at is maybe the very concept of trying to, you know, get inside the inner workings of a culture by hanging out with people who are part of it and documenting their everyday lives. Maybe just doing that in and of itself is exercising a kind of power over them. And maybe, whether the anthropologists like it or not, they rely on that power differential to be able to do the research to begin with. Um, the fact is you need to, you know, you need the blessing of a university to go do the research, and then you often need the blessing of a national government or some agency of it to let you in, and some local scholars or officials to vouch for you, etc. So in that context, um, odds are at least some people in the field, as we used to say, and some still do say, at least some people you're working with are going to feel probably obligated to talk to you because you're some kind of powerful outsider who's been vouched for by powerful members of their own society. So based on these and some other concerns in that 25-year retrospective article I mentioned, uh, Gustafson called for polymorphous engagement, as he put it, as a new kind of fieldwork method to kind of get anthropology away from that reliance on just participant observation. So in his words, that would mean interacting with informants across a number of dispersed sites, not just in local communities, and sometimes in virtual form, which is pretty interesting for 1997. It wasn't easy to do that back then. Uh, what else? Collecting data eclectically from a disparate array of sources in many different ways. So all of this was a way of downplaying anthropology's obsession with participant observation. And that wasn't just out of respect for the cultures of marginalized groups, it's also to make studying up more feasible, because the reality is it's easier said than done to just say that anthropology should start studying the powerful as much as the less powerful, because anthropology tends to be critical of the powerful, the powerful often don't like being criticized, and uh, the powerful usually have the power to not let you into their community or into their, you know, practice of work or whatever. The powerful also tend to have things like public relations departments and bureaucrats whose job is to make them look good or at least neutral or normal all the time. 
So by doing everything they can to allow only a very carefully curated image of that corporation or the organization to make it out to the public and kind of ensuring that any representation of it stays like on brand. So even if the anthropologist does land an interview with someone important at that corporation or at that government agency or whatever the case may be, that interview from personal experience is often not very useful to the anthropologist apart from being able to say that it happened because everything the official will say in the interview is probably already in the organization's press releases or website anyway because all the messages are you know curated and 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 on brand um so what i'm saying is face-to-face -face interaction with someone powerful is no guarantee that what they say is you know authentic or that it's kind of a legit ethnographic moment or piece of information but anyway, like I said before, Nader said in 1972 that a lot of the excitement around studying up was there because that approach could demystify power structures and institutions. So I want to pick up on that thread as it appears in some more recent work. Well, by recent, I mean like from 11 years ago because anthropology moves slow, as I've also said before. I'm talking about a 2009 ethnography called Liquidated, an ethnography of Wall Street by Karen Ho. This is based on field work that she did on Wall Street in the 1990s, those uh, exciting days that I mentioned at the start when uh, some business journalists were actually saying that that unprecedented expansion of those years would just never stop expanding, um, magically, I guess. Anyway, the first question is, you know, it's an ethnography of Wall Street. What is Wall Street anyway? Well, Wall Street is an actual street. It's where the New York Stock Exchange and the NASDAQ and some corporate headquarters are. But Wall Street is also a concept that's used to kind of stand in for the American financial services industry as, as a whole, or sometimes corporations as a whole. As Karen Ho puts it, Wall Street is, quote, the concentration of financial institutions and actor networks, investment banks, pension and mutual funds, stock exchanges, hedge funds, and private equity firms, that embody a particular financial ethos and set of practices and act as primary spokespeople for the globalization of U.S. capitalism. Note the mention of actor networks. That's, I think, an interesting sidebar that I'll say just a few words about. It's, it's, it's a theory from the field of science and technology studies, so a bit off topic, but I'll make this quick. Um, its, it's best-known proponent is probably Bruno Latour, a sociologist. To put it as simply as I can, an, an actor network is like this assemblage of, of human and non-human so-called actors that are usually seen as, you know, when acting together as like taking on a life or an identity of, of its own. So in this case, it's, it's what we think of as Wall Street, uh, not the actual, you know, road, although that is a part of it. Well, it's not a road, it's a street, but you get the point. Um, the network consists of, you know, the actual street, Wall Street. It consists of specific banks, uh, specific buildings that those banks are housed in, the people who work in those banks, the computers they use, the people whose money is invested in those banks, um, the staplers and the hole punchers that are used in the banks, the security cameras, etc. I can go on and on. Um, it's a complex theory that I don't have time to fully get into, but if you want to hear what else I have to say about it, there is a link in the description to another video of mine that goes into actor network theory in, in more detail. It's, it's also timestamped at the moment where I start talking about it if you care to check it out. The point for now for the purposes of, of this video is the main takeaway, I guess, from actor network theory is, is the demystification of complicated systems that we often take for granted. So the point is that Wall Street, or more generally, you know, the, the market as it's often, you know, thought of, it's, it's not this kind of organic being or natural force that just operates according to this unchangeable natural logic. That's how the market is often described. Um, it's not really that according to actor network theory. It's just a system of people using tools to do work and make decisions together. So like everything else humans do together, it, it can be very powerful. And indeed, this one is extremely powerful. It's, but it's also cultural and it can be changed. Oh, well, let's get on to what Karen Ho actually did. So how did she do this piece of studying up? Um, and why did she do it? Well, she introduces the whole ethnography with this moment in 1995 that inspired her to do this kind of work. Um, it was one day in particular when AT&T, the American uh, telecom giant, announced huge layoffs. And it was also a great day for that company's share price on the stock market. 
In fact, the news was so great to, you know, Wall Street was that, that several other stocks of other huge corporations also had exceptionally great days because it was assumed that if AT&T was laying off thousands of people, that so would these other companies. So that moment that kind of embodied this this contradiction of, of Wall Street, I guess, that's what inspired her to to begin this project of studying up by doing an anthropological study of the institutions that, that made this decision happen, basically. But studying up means studying those more powerful than you, usually, and this wasn't entirely the case for this ethnography, because she writes of, uh, in her words, leveraging her socioeconomic background and her connections with elite universities to get in, to get into the field of, of Wall Street. Because at that time, in 95, Karen Ho was exactly who the Wall Street investment banks wanted to hire. She was a high-achieving graduate student at an Ivy League university, which she describes as kind of a pipeline to Wall Street for a lot of people. Well, that's actually my, that's, that's my metaphor. She describes it as a kinship system. Uh, in her words, it was, quote, not far-fetched to argue that elite kinship creates a bridge or a network to access financial capital. So by attending a recruitment event on campus, which happened all the time at Ivy League schools, um, investment banks have recruitment events to kind of woo new, or, you know, soon-to-be graduates to... Uh, apply to their bank. Anyway, she got the role through one of those events, landed the job at a Wall Street investment bank, and then started doing ethnography while on the job as a rookie consultant, basically. Which sounds like a very complicated and difficult role to navigate. As she described it at one point in the ethnography, she was an employee first, a friend second, and a field worker third. Um, after six, six months it was, after six months of working in that role, she was then downsized along with many others and then continued her field work for some time after in, in a different kind of capacity. And then two years after that, the bank she had worked for was bought out and, and absorbed. So that's a kind of typical sign of the times for that, that era of uh, investment banks. Okay, so what did she find? The whole thing is really unstable and there's not a lot of overtly Marxist theorizing in this ethnography. But I think her findings really fit within the Marxist view that capitalism is prone to crisis. So if you, if you care to hear more about this in more detail, there's a link in the description to my The Concept of Class video that you know expands upon this. But just to summarize, the theory goes, there's two fundamental classes in a capitalist society. There's the capitalist class who owns the land, the labor, the resources that are needed to produce the things that society needs to keep going. That's the capitalist class who owns all that, and then there's everyone else, people who don't own what's called the means of production, and whose only real option is to go to work and get paid so they can then buy the things they need to survive, so they can pay rent and, and buy groceries, basically, and maybe have something else left over other stuff. Anyway, the argument is these two groups, these two classes, are fundamentally opposed because they both want a bigger share of the same limited pie. The whole point of running a business is to make as much money as possible, and the whole point of going to work at a business is to get paid as much as possible. Uh, higher pay for workers cuts into the profit margin of owners, so it's this conflicted and adversarial system made up of, of two classes, one with you know pretty much all the power, uh, two classes that you know want a bigger share of the same pie. Anyway. Because the system is based on self-interest and it, it's it's hostile to any kind of planning or, or like sharing um, or limits on any individual's pursuit on becoming as rich as possible, and that's especially the case with neoliberal capitalism, which has become normal you know across most of the planet since about the 70s or 80s. Um, for these reasons, it's unstable, it's shaky, and it's prone to crisis. And uh, it's not just the Marxists who say this. As I said, people who love capitalism and make it happen, uh, talk about the business cycle, and it's just known that the, the economy goes through cycles and it has periodic ups and downs. And, uh, you know, in, in my lifetime alone, I can think of several crises off the top of my head that happened in a relatively short time frame in terms of, you know, the entire history of the capitalist system. So let's, let's, let's just name a couple quickly just to kind of make the point. There was the 1987 stock market crash, um, the early 90s recession, then there was the 1997 Asian financial crisis, um, the dot-com meltdown of 2000, which, as I said before, kind of bled into the effects of the uh, the fallout from 9-11. So, the, oh yeah, and the recession, the, the U.S. economy was already in, in recession during those times. Um, 
then the rebound, and then the 2008 to 09 Great Recession, as it was called, the 2010 one day crash, and then the rebound again, and then now the COVID crisis. So, all those things I just mentioned, those are separate moments that often get called crises. You know, kind of each one is a crisis of its own, but especially when they're so close together, they kind of bleed into one long permanent crisis, really. And many have said that frustration with that perpetual crisis has led to things like the conspiracy theories and other delusional and distorted and hateful thinking that is now fueling violent extremism in many places worldwide. So what's it like to work at the heart of that system, this, this crisis-prone, unstable, shaky system, to analyze that? Karen Ho turns to this, this part of the theory of, of habitus from Pierre Bourdieu, which is a system of, of ways of being and acting. Or as Karen Ho puts it, she studied, quote, the structure and formation of investment bankers' habitus, how they have developed an investment banking ethos instead of experiences that frame and empower them to impose regimes of restructuring and deal-making onto corporate America and ultimately help to engender financial market crisis. And to continue on that point, I think this next quote gets at the value of ethnography to answer why constant corporate liquidation, including the downsizing of employees, has been celebrated and justified on Wall Street. It is necessary to understand how the people heralding downsizing themselves experience it. And yet, Wall Street investment bankers understand the necessity of constantly performing in notoriously insecure work environments, not as a liability, but as a challenge. So the ups and downs of the business cycle get rationalized as, as being a challenge for uh, basically people who have been led to believe they are the smartest people on earth. And uh, Karen Ho calls this a culture of smartness. And there's a, a nice quote from the ethnography that summarizes this as well. To be considered smart on Wall Street is to be implicated in a web of situated practices and ideologies co-produced through the interactions of multiple institutions, processes, and American culture at large, which confer authority and legitimacy on high finance and contribute to the sector's vast influence. The culture of smartness is not simply a quality of Wall Street, but it is a currency, a driving force productive of both profit accumulation and global prowess. That's why people not only put up with this system, but also seem to maybe enjoy it. It's a challenge for the smart in their view. Even though the employees on, on her level were, you know, at, at these banks also live in constant fear of downsizing. There's more to it than that, but you can read the book on your own. But that's kind of the nutshell of what this boils down to. This this hegemonic idea of, uh, you know, we're, we're smart. We must be up for the challenge. It's just a natural part of the business cycle. And because we're so smart, we have the tools to kind of ride it out and, you know, improve ourselves. But I want to close on this uh, this point, going back to Nader's 1972 article. There's an interesting connection made here between that piece and some of the even older anthropology that I've covered earlier in this series. I'm talking about Malinowski's research on the Kula Ring uh, in the Trobrian Islands in the 1920s. So just to recap briefly, the Kula Ring was a sort of exchange system that Malinowski noticed in the field where people were making these long, dangerous trips between islands to trade jewelry. Um, and it turns out this was a very complex and important part of their political and economic systems and also their kinship systems, uh, just to try to summarize it in a nutshell. In episode two of this series, I talked about how Malinowski noted that not everyone in the Trobrian Islands seemed to understand how Kula worked, but they knew how important it was and really believed in it. Um, and he also found that people would sort of tell him one thing about it and then do something different with it. And my point in that episode was that you could say kind of the same thing about anybody. You know, how many people in a capitalist society really understand how capitalism works or how many are able to explain it coherently to someone on a moment's notice and how many people in a capitalist society always do and say the same thing, right? Um, well, Laura Nader quoted an anonymous student in 1972 who made a similar connection, and I'll just show you that quote briefly. To say that Kula Ring participants don't perform in practice what they say they do has very different consequences from saying that a government agency is not living up to its standards. This isn't to say that the government agency shouldn't be studied or the fact it isn't living up to its standards shouldn't be pointed out. The question is, can the anthropologist do a structural study and then enroll as citizen, point out that the agency is screwing the American public? 
So that was a direct quote from the Lori Nader article. She was quoting a student from 1972. I'll leave it there. There's some open-ended questions that I think are interesting. Um, how critical can an anthropologist really be of their own society or of certain institutions in their society, especially when they're enmeshed in them? Um, what are the standards and who gets to decide? I'll come back to this in a bit, a bit later on in a, in a future episode on ethnography during the current crisis, uh, the COVID crisis. But again, is that, is, that, is that its own crisis or is it a continuation of this perpetual crisis that I described earlier? Lots to think about. Um, appreciate your time. Thanks for watching. I'll be back soon.